I took a shower with the uh, six-year-old. He's six, he's not 16. Um, <laughs> if you've never showered with a six-year-old, let me give you some advice. Make sure it's yours. Otherwise, <laughs> it's strange if you're like, what's your name? Tom Segura is one of my favourite stand-up comedians. He's in my top 10. I've seen all his specials, I follow his YouTube channel, and I've even seen him live, twice. He has that casual, observational style of stand-up. He doesn't try too hard like Joe Rogan, for example, and his timing is impeccable. Combine that with his sort of odd, unpredictable nature and his relaxed, almost aloof demeanour, and you have one of the best stand-up comedians in the world. I saw a racial fight recently, which is terrible, but I watched it. <laughs> How are you not gonna watch? You're gonna watch every fight, you know? Fights have that weird quality. Fights are kind of like hand jobs, and that like, you don't really want one, but you're like, well, let's see where it goes, you know? Like, <laughs> like will you give it a kiss? No? All right, so yeah. <laughs> Had to take a shot. So, But here's the thing. Tom Segura hates poor people. Here's the thing. If you're, if you're still mad about this, just know that it's your mindset and you're thinking like a fucking loser, but you don't have to. You don't. You can change the way you think, but you have to accept the way you're thinking right now is not going to get you anywhere. You're being bitter, you're being petty, you're insecure, you're not confident, and you can change that, but you have to be proactive. If you just sit around and you, you know what? You only have what you have because of fans, so don't talk about us like that. Yeah, but you're still a loser if you're thinking like that. And so you're maybe, uh, I'm lucky to have you as a loser fan, but you don't have to be that way. You could be a winner, you know? You just gotta change the way you think. Okay, hang on. I think we need some context here, but just before we do that, if you haven't already subscribed, get on board because we've just passed two and a half thousand subscribers and we're growing fast. I appreciate all of you who are jumping on at the ground level. Now, back to Tom Segura. Let's take a step back and see how this feud between him and some of his fans started. I'm not sure why, but it only seems appropriate to listen to a Burt Kreischer story. Maybe that'll help. Yeah, if you're, if you're like right in the front row and some guy's wearing a $50,000 a watch, that's a little distracting. You're looking at my arm the whole time. Yeah, yeah, you're like, hmm. the, yeah. Um, but you always say you have trouble spending money, and I don't, I don't believe Hold that. on, let me tell you, this is my favorite story. Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's I, another bullshit. <laughs> so I sent, so I I sent Tom it. a text at this Rolex place in Vegas. Story checks out. And I text, and I say... I, a picture of the watch, and he goes, "Are you getting it?" And I said, "I don't think so." I have trouble spending money. I have trouble spending money. I, I leave the place. I, I, I sent don't the guy it. from a Rolex store. I, I leave the place. Well, I like looking at him. Yeah. So I leave the place. <laughs> it must be fun for the dealer. Tom t <laughs> sends me a very heartfelt text. Hey man, you're you're busting your ass on the road. You work nonstop. You're gone two weeks at a time. You have two podcasts. It goes on in like this really heartfelt text. You deserve to treat yourself every now and then. This is an affordable treat. Do it for yourself. And so I go back. I buy the watch. Next day, I'm sitting and having coffee, watch, looking at the watch, going, God damn it, I love this fucking watch. I really love looking at it. It cheers me up. And I call Tom. I said, hey, man, I appreciate you sending me that message. Leanne tried to convince me, and I wouldn't do it, but your message meant so much to me. He's like, oh, cool. I go, what are you doing? He goes, well, you know, I sent you that message, and I realized that shit applies to me, too. I'm, I'm, at, a Ro I'm at a Rolex store. I'm buying a new Rolex. Wow. <laughs> he bought a new Rolex the next day. Yeah. yeah. Tom, favorite... Tommy's my favorite guy to call about cars. Because Tommy and me have the same love of cars. We, we go off. So I've heard that story a few times across the Rogan podcast universe. And if you don't listen to this elite brotherhood of comedians turned podcasters, turned watch collectors, turned car collectors, turned property investors, well, they like to talk about these things a lot, especially Kreischer and Segura. And like clockwork, a group of their fans, large enough to obviously catch their attention, started turning against them. And it must have struck a nerve with Tom because he had a special message for them. They were living rent-free in his head, it seems. Oh, can I just say this real quick? Yeah. I just, every time we talk about like a watch or a car, 
I'll get a, a, like a, a bunch of messages from losers that <laughs> that try to tell me that mm -hmm. I'm I'm making them feel bad about their situation. You're in control of your own situation and your own feelings. So don't put it on me that you feel bad that I have something that, oh, but I, I'm struggling with rent this month. Figure it the fuck out, okay? Like, don't make my life be a problem for your life. If you don't like it, guess what? You're not going to be able to control what people talk about. People are going to talk about things that you don't have for the rest of your fucking life. So you can decide, like, okay, I won't li Fine, don't listen to me. Don't listen to that person anymore. But you have to control your own feelings, okay? It's not on other people to make sure they don't talk about a topic that makes you feel bad, all right? Like, I lost 20 grand gambling this weekend. Go ahead. I understand if, you know, hey, man, if, if you got, like, physical ailments and we're making fun of physical ailments, that's fine. But achievements, you should look at people it's, who achieve and get inspired, I think. The, the main problem that I have with the actual, with the issue is somebody saying, you having a conversation makes me feel bad about my situation. Therefore, you should avoid that. It's like, dude, you don't live in the real world. No. If that's, if that's how you think the world works, that you can let people know that a conversation about something makes you feel bad about your situation, good fucking luck. As you're, okay? you're, 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 you're establishing yourself as powerless. Uh, you absolutely, and you're taking no ownership of your own feelings. Like people have said to me before, you know, this, uh, this joke you did, it made me feel bad. And I go, no, it, I, I didn't do that. And they're like, no, no, it did. I go, no, 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 no. You are in charge of your own feelings. Yeah. You are. So you can't put it on me that the joke made you feel bad. You feel bad. You chose to feel bad. It's not, it's not my responsibility to control how you feel. So wait, there are people in this world that when they see fancy things on screen, they, yeah, they feel terrible. Yeah, of course. Oh, good. Oh, you're talking about a, a nice car? I don't have a nice car and, and I'm struggling right now. It's like, all right, you even people should stop talking about cars? Yeah. One yeah. more thing I got to tell to people who are like, because I was thinking about this too. Like, <laughs> I love this part of you. I listen, love this part of you. I, uh, I, I was the same way that you were when I was broke. I, I never got mad yeah. at somebody who was like, here's my 911 or here's my Rolex, whatever. I mean, yeah. I'd watch those. I'd be like, oh, that's awesome. I hope I can get that. You know, yeah. or I'm, I want to work towards stuff that. stuff I hope I can get. Here's the thing. If you're, if you're still mad about this, just know that it's your mindset and you're thinking like a fucking loser, but you don't have to. You don't. You can change the way you think, but you have to accept the way you're thinking right now is not going to get you anywhere. You're being bitter. You're being petty. You're insecure. You're not confident. And you can change that, but you have to be proactive. If you just sit around and you, oh, you know what? You only have what you have because of fans. So don't talk about us like that. Yeah, but you're still a loser if you're thinking like that. And so you're maybe, uh, I'm lucky to have you as a loser fan, but you don't have to be that way. You could be a winner. You know, you just got to change the way you think. I've always found this kind of dynamic really interesting. You have these super talented, quirky, weirdo artists like actors, directors, and comedians like Tom Segura who start their careers struggling to pay rent, struggling to pay the bills. They slog it out, work day in, day out to get noticed. They have mental health struggles. They feel like quitting every day, but they push through. And for the fortunate 0.2%, 0.0001% of them, they eventually break through with some help from their boy Joe Rogan, but that's another story for a different video. And so they end up with this flood of fame and fortune. I mean, these guys all make more money in a week than you and me make in a year. They're no longer struggling by any means. They all have several cars, several houses, travel in private jets. You get the idea. So it doesn't take long for the struggle to wear off and their fame and fortune to become normal for them. They earned it, right? I mean, they deserve it, right? Well, I don't know if that's a question I can answer. It's kind of complicated. There are plenty of super talented, funny as fuck comedians and actors that we've never heard of and sadly we never will. There just isn't enough room at the top for everyone. But for these guys who've made it, they develop a sense of entitlement that grows and grows. And here's the problem. 
A lot of stand-up comedians are defined by their struggle. They make observations about the world that the average person can relate to. They overthink everyday ordinary things, and that shit makes us laugh. Have a look at this brilliant bit from Tom Segura back when he was a fat fuck. I got into online shopping recently. I guess that's a thing. Here's what I've been doing, though. I shop for things that are, like, way out of my price range. And then after a while, I go, oh, yeah, uh, I can't afford that. Like, today I was looking at yachts. <laughs> Online. And then I was telling myself I didn't want them as if they were an option, you know? <laughs> I was like, 155 feet? That's not even big enough for all my friends and family. I'm not getting that shit. <laughs> what the fuck am I doing? You ever do that? You ever go down like a rabbit hole online and then like six hours have gone by and you're like, I am shopping for the private jet that best suits my needs. <laughs> I think I found, this is it right here, the G550. How much is this place order? $53 million. <laughs> well, maybe not now, but maybe later. I'll just bookmark that shit for now. <laughs> okay. I'm going to play the rest of it for you, but pay close attention to the person he's describing here. You know what that is? That's a sense of entitlement. That's me thinking I should be associated with this thing, and I haven't earned it. I have neither of you, but also me. <laughs> I get that feeling the most when I get upgraded to first class. Yeah, I fly every week. I never buy first class ticket. I buy coach tickets. I buy them so much. I get bumped up to first class. I'm telling you, the moment I get bumped up to first class, I get washed over with this feeling. I'm like, look at these fucking poor pieces of shit. <laughs> Ugh. So much better than them. <laughs> Don't stand next to me. Ugh, dude. I dare you to try to come up from coach and use the first class bathroom when I'm there. I'll put my hand on your chest, okay? <laughs> There's a pig trough in the back. That's for you guys. It's for the big ballers up front. Some people buy first class tickets. I always feel like they know you got upgraded. They always give you the look like, by the way, we fucking know. You can sit up here, but you're not like us. Tom Segura has become the guy he used to joke about. That's pretty funny, right? But then it became kind of cringy, and then it became really cringy. Let me explain. After his most recent multi million dollar Netflix special called Sledgehammer, he released a 27 minute behind the scenes documentary called I Came Everywhere, which covered his world tour called I'm Coming Everywhere. You can watch it on his YouTube channel. I'll leave a link in the description as well. It's had over 1.6 million views. And I've got to say, the production quality is very good. It's a very well-made documentary. There's no doubt about that. It was produced by YMH Studios, which Tom owns. And these guys know what they're doing. But after following this ongoing feud between Tom and some of his followers, I watched this behind-the-scenes documentary with... A different set of eyes. Working with Tom is, I mean, you, you really can't ask for anything better. I can't, man. <laughs> I mean, it's... Hang on, hang on. That's his fitness trainer. I started touring with Tom back on the Ball Hog Tour. When we were training together, he thought, he thought it would be a good idea, you know, to go out like the last quarter of the tour and, you know, train him while he was on the road. You can pretty much throw anything at him and he doesn't quit. I hope you're counting how many times he goes on his phone during a workout. That was not on my phone. What was that? I was checking the message from my agent. That's going on his phone. That's not socialized. Because I'm committed to the game. He's just one of those people where it feels like he'll just die before he actually quits. He's 
probably one of the hardest workers in the room, for sure. His work ethic, I mean, as far as working out goes and comedy, I, you know, I think bar none is just top tier. I mean, he's always looking for the next project. Um, he's always got his hands in something, you know, whether it's writing a book or writing the special or racing you know, or podcasting. I mean, it's just, there's always something going on. There's never a dull moment. I, I don't understand how he does it. So apart from these little homoerotic love tributes from guys that Tom pays to follow him around the world, the whole documentary was like a love poem from Tom to himself. I mean, the idea from what I could tell was to give his followers behind the scenes access into what goes on during these tours. For me, at least, I expected to see some fan meetups and interactions with his fans, exclusive access into how Tom prepares his material, you know, the blood, sweat and tears that goes into putting on a world tour. I think that shit's interesting. But we didn't get any of that. What we did get was this clearly staged exchange between Tom and his family literally two minutes into the documentary, after the intro and all that, where he basically just gives them money like he's the godfather or something. I'm in Las Vegas. Uh, we're at the Aria right now. I'm about a week out from shooting my Netflix special, my fifth one, in Phoenix. And I got shows here uh, in town. And uh, my sister and mom are here, my little sister Jane. I, I told them to meet in their room. I would give them some... They're kind of grifters and they just... Uh, they have their hand out for money all the time. And I guess I'm their bank. Here you go. Really? You can have that too, yeah. I get big bills because he loves me. You never win with your because own strategy. I was playing my 20 cents and 25 cents. And right, and it never works. What? Try big. Right. Yeah, okay, I know it's big, very fast. That's how a gambling works. Would be no bring your wallet. Why do I have to open my wall? Because I am broke. I am totally broke. I mean, totally broke. You totally broke? I gave you money last night. Yeah, where did you think it is? And the machine. So then how could I owe you if I gave you money last night? Because that money is gone, so charity, please. I think I had it. Come on, Tommy. How do you know you're going to see me again? How am I not going to see you again? Because she talks about dying every day. All right, this is way too much. It's too much subject. But how much do you think you I don't know. I think since you don't know, I don't need to be with her, but... Add a little bit more. A little bit more. Please. Please. You're like a... A very fair street. I... There. It's more than enough. Or what? For one hour? How does it keep getting to be... It just indeed that we put I just did. Uh, uh, You're good. Uh, no, 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 that's enough. That's enough. Please, stop. No, no. What? One, one hundred. No. One, one... Uh, Tommy, please. Unbelievable. <laughs> Shadow, you should leave something to the ladies. Oh, so, you can wear it, right? Yeah. Okay, for me to... Yeah. No. Have you ever seen anything like that? <laughs> no, I can't say that. I have. <laughs> Tom clearly fancies himself as this sort of daddy figure to everyone in his life, where he takes them under his wing and looks after them in exchange for their undivided loyalty and affection. The scale of it is bananas. I've never ridden on a private plane before. One of those is my bunk. Like, I know which one I'm going to. The nicest hotels I've ever been to. The biggest shows I've ever done, by far. The Ball Arena, where the Denver Nuggets play. He sold that out two times. Did a week of shows in New York City. DJ Premier did sets on a few of those. Like, fucking primo. Now, if you take all these clips individually, they don't seem that bad, but the whole 27-minute documentary was full of this kind of shit. It wasn't this exclusive behind-the-scenes access to one of the world's best comedians. It was more of a tribute to Tom Segura by Tom Segura for Tom Segura. And man, if you want to see some cringe, take a look at this. It's stressful. Nobody understands this. I think people think that like you're... Like, oh, like you're on a trip. Like, hey, do you want to come on a, on a fun trip with me? That's not how I look at doing shows. It's not a vacation, doing shows. It's not 
a vacation. Doing sh it's not a vacation. I've always been this guy that just stays in his room, but I really was excited to do things. And I had befriended Daniel Ricardo, the F1 driver, and he invited me to his ranch in Perth. I ended up riding a dirt bike, which I shouldn't do. And I ate shit. He was laughing so hard as I was on the ground and like covered in blood. I was like, this is a good guy. I rode a horseback shirtless through a body of water. New experiences, fun things, doing sh It's not a vacation. We were in Adelaide. We did 15,000 people in Sydney, which was insane. Something close to that in Melbourne. In Brisbane, we actually went to uh, Bluey's house. My, uh, my youngest is a fan of Bluey. Um, it's a cartoon, and this is some real dad stuff. On this tour, I've had also the most incredible meals, especially internationally. I'm so fortunate that, that we're able to do this. I'd never performed stand-up in South America. I didn't even think it would ever be something that I would do, but I went to uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Had one of the best shows and also ate like a fucking king. And then we flew to Chile, had an amazing show there. I stopped in Peru, in Lima, Peru, and saw family, and then finished the leg in Mexico City. Came back home, got a little bit of rest, and then had to ramp up for the 40-day European tour. All the way west until we ended up in the UK. Also got to do stand-up in Madrid, in Barcelona, Copenhagen, Paris, London, Birmingham, and Glasgow. Whole tour came to an end in Iceland, which was such an epic ending. It was a great way to end it all. Doing sh it's not a vacation. And finally, no documentary about Tom Segura would be complete without some subtle references to his car collection. He tries to mask it with a joke, so you can't tell that it's a low-key flex. We stumbled on this absolutely stunning Ferrari. There's only 33 cars left that we know about, but all the engines are accounted for, so they still, even though they've crashed, they pulled the engine out, kept the engine. First time you're a kid and you start liking cars, you end up hearing somebody say something about, like, especially performance cars. They go, this is just a man that's compensating for his small penis, right? And you're like, oh, okay, I guess that's what all right. And then the older you get, you know, sometimes you, you, you grow this affection for cars. And I'm one of those people where I really, I really like cars. And then you get to this point where you're like, oh, like, wait a minute. Do I actually love these cars? Or is this because I have a small penis? So with all of this in mind... What are we to make of Tom Segura? Well, I think there are three camps of people here. The first are those who couldn't give a fuck. They think Tom's funny, they watch his specials, some of his podcast clips, and they don't really care about how rich he is and all the shit that he buys. The second camp are the opposite. They also think Tom's funny, but all his bragging and gloating over his wealth and possessions has gotten them offside. They liked his comedy for its rawness and its truth. They could relate to him. But now he's this big shot flying around in private jets, customising his Porsches and collecting expensive watches. He's an elite now. The flavour's fizzling away. It kind of reminds me of those rappers who got rich by rapping about being rich. Yeah, sit on that one for a moment. But then there's the third camp, which is where I think I sit. We think Tom's funny and we follow most of his content. We see this feud and start putting some of the pieces of the puzzle together. We're noticing his narcissism more and more, but we don't hate him. We just think that outside of his stand-up comedy, the money's going to his head and he's becoming a little bit cringy. I mean, that's not the end of the world, right? The problem for Tom will be when he's made so much money that he no longer remembers what it means to be the average person. And when you produce so much content that there's seemingly endless hours of your conversations on the record, when he finally does cross that line, it'll be there for everyone to see. Except he won't see it. And that's where it ends for Tom. 
The funny thing is, Bert Kreischer's probably further along than Tom when it comes to finally crossing that line. So it looks like Tom Segura's in good company. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched it 10 times. Anyway, let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Remember, the best comment gets pinned. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, hit that like button and become a subscriber so you can keep up to date with all my latest uploads. I'll chat to you guys soon. See you in the next one. When did Tom Segura get famous? My first special came out on Netflix in 2014 and it's called Completely Normal, and that definitely changed my touring life. And then with each subsequent special, it increased. Podcasting became much more popular, and so it's just been kind of year by year, which I think is probably the better way to get some type of uh, recognition from people. It's probably better than an explosion of popularity. And I mean, after this interview, I'm probably gonna be way more famous.